Welcome to the Journey Church in Hiram. How are you guys doing today? It's good to see you. I've got to get back to page one here. I have one. Uh, let's pray, and then we're going to read the scripture, and then I'm going to pray again. This is a, this is a text that's pretty heavy. Um, you can go ahead and put it up. Um, we need to get our hearts in the right spot. Father, I, we lift up your name this morning. We ask that you would, you would come and you would fill us with your spirit, your spirit of wisdom and revelation, that it would open the eyes of our hearts, that we want to know more about you and less about ourselves. We want to know more about what you bring and less about what we think we can give. I ask that you would illuminate this word into our minds and our hearts. Would you get me out of the way and let, let your word do its thing? Pray this in the name of Jesus. If you have your Bible, open with me to Mark chapter 15, please. We've been in Mark for a while now. We're coming to the end here, coming to the end of the, the story. And it says this, And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and whole council, and they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he said to him, or he answered him, You have said so. And the chief priest accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast he used to release for them one prisoner from whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him! And Pilate said to them, Why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him! So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. If you'd bow your heads again, I'm going to read Isaiah 53 as a prayer over us. And then we'll get started. It says this, Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him. He had no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. By he, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he often opened not his mouth. Father, we turn our eyes to you, Jesus. We lift up our, our eyes to you. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. A few months back, a friend of mine and I were debating about uh, a number of things. We've been debating for years about religion and philosophy and this thing and that thing, you know, where, where we might live and 
what we might do with our lives, all kinds of things that plague the male brain. And uh, eventually we come around to the topic of the highest of truths. And I, 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 we, I know we have differences. He's not a Christian, and I'm, I already know where he stands. But I just posed the question. I said, but what about grace? What about the grace of God in Christ Jesus that, that offers you the free gift of life at the price of his son? What about grace? Have you tried that? Have you thought about that? What he said to me was, what he said to me was, I don't need Jesus because I don't need a Savior. There's no need for a Savior when there's no such thing as sin. His response is the brutal, honest truth about all of our hearts and the sin, one of the central truths of this story. His response is a perfect illustration of the depravity to which all of humanity has been bound. Apart from Christ, the human heart is bound to this testimony. Crucify Jesus. I'm the center of the world. This is the dark, bitter decay of every human heart. At the center of all of us is not the magical answer to happiness. It's not there. We can't unlock it with the right balance of positive and negative energy. We can't reach deep inside ourselves and muster up all the moral platitudes that that we can find to rectify our addictions to self. No, the heart is sick. It is unashamedly beyond repair. And we cannot even see this problem clearly. We can't see... Jesus, as he stands before us, the Son of God, as he stands before us and we're shouting, crucify, as we bring our accusations before God, we're already blind to the fact that it's God that stands before us. Now, I totally get, we all agree, self-preservation and thinking about ourselves and considering ourselves is important, but there's something blatantly wrong in the universe when we have decided that God needs to be on trial, that accusations need to fly towards the Son of God. Something has gone wrong here. It's, it's quite crazy at times to consider the picture. In Mark 1, it says that all the religious leaders got together and they figured out a way to indict Jesus on charges that would lead to his death. They, the, the religious leaders of this day could not perform capital punishment. They had to turn that charge over to the Roman rulers, and the Roman rulers had to rule that charge on Jesus. So they they came up with this charge, are you the king of the Jews? This is the same thing that we do, is it not? We come up with reasons why God's not delivering our agenda the way that we think it should go. You see... Jesus' response is, you have said so. It seems kind of uh, vague. It seems like at the one moment Jesus should be proclaiming very clearly what's going on here. He says, you have said so. Jesus gets four words, and men seem to get 240. It seems like men are ruling the picture here, doesn't it? It seems like Jesus is weak and out of control. But God is not short here for lack of knowledge or lack of power. He's not silent at his own trial because he's helpless or weak or confused. He's not caught off guard. Jesus is silent to let the foolishness of men run its course so that his grace might be truly revealed. God may be silent in your life right now. You might know he exists. You might believe there is a God. But this Jesus, he may be silent to you right now. And this is a sobering picture of why it might be so. It might be that you're busy throwing accusations at Jesus Christ, the Son of God, not realizing that the King of glory stands before you, and he really is the center of the world. Your accusations, my accusations against God and his way of doing things puts us in a place where we're blind. We don't see it. We don't get it. This is an absurd situation when men are accusing God. It's a lot like uh, my four-year-old. When his accusations start flying at mom and dad, you know, when, like when your kid wants something 
Like, for instance, our son Jacob, he, comes, he gets up real early, and the first thing out of his mouth is, Daddy or Mommy, can I have some chocolate? At 6.45 a.m., can I have some chocolate? And I immediately say, no, you can't have chocolate right now. And it's like DEFCON 12 breaks out in the house, and he goes running upstairs to Mom looking for another answer, looking for the answer he needs to get that chocolate. And accusations start to fly. I can just picture myself back when I was a kid. I don't remember these things clearly. I'm sure my parents over here remember when I was a teenager probably shouting about the fact that they're not giving me happiness the way it should be. They're not delivering all the toys that I need to make my life count, right? It's, it's laughable in that picture because we know that we are the proper authority. We're at the proper center of our children's lives, directing and guiding them and helping them be free. But it's absurd when you switch the picture and we're the child and God creator is in control, guiding and directing our lives, but we decide to shout back at him. You're screwing this one up, Lord. Don't you see what I was trying to accomplish here? We are constantly looking up and doing this. God, you got that one wrong. It says in verse 3, they bound Jesus. They led him away. <clears throat> they delivered him over to Pilate. Our accusations against God literally bind him from our life. They deliver him up and out of our lives. We don't need him anymore. Look at verse 10 with me, please. It says, Pilate perceived it was out of envy that they delivered Jesus up. Envy. They're envying Jesus for something. That's a perplexing thing and motive to be the shouts to crucify Jesus. He's a poor man, a humble man, a man who spent his entire life serving others, healing the blind and the lame, pronouncing freedom to the demon-possessed. What, what's to envy here? Well, what we know is that for 14 chapters up until this point, Jesus has not just been healing the blind and casting out demons, but he's been pronouncing a kingdom that is all about him. He's been pronouncing himself in the position of authority that only he can command. So what the religious leaders are envious of is his authority over them. They're envious for his control, for his centrality in God's story. It's our envy after the centrality of Jesus that sends him to the cross. Do you see this? It's our envy after the centrality of Jesus in God's redemptive story that is the sin that God uses to send him to the cross. Jesus claimed this authority all throughout Mark. He claimed authority over all things. Just, just a few examples. Mark 1.15, Jesus says, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. You see, the kingdom of God is advancing, not each one of our personal agendas. We're all wrapped up in what he's doing. In Mark 2, 5, Jesus says, Son, your sins are forgiven. Only Jesus has the authority to forgive sins. Sins actually exist. Uh, every, everything this world says is that sin is no more. That's an outdated way of thinking. In Mark 2, 27, Jesus says, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Man, the Son of Man is even Lord of the Sabbath. You see, Jesus is Lord of all of God's rules and judgments, and he, he perfectly fulfills them in our place. He really is the center of everything. In Mark 7, 20, Jesus says, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For, for from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All of these things come from within. It is out of the heart of man. Our hearts are sick. We are envying after the, the centrality of God. We 
want to be center. We want to be in control. You see, Jesus, this is, this is the beautiful portrait of the gospel. Jesus doesn't give us room here to call him a good moral teacher or one of God's good prophets. He's not just a sage. He only gives us room here to call him Lord. Only God can be in command of such a situation as this, to let the sins of man, our envying hearts, take him to his death and weave that into the tapestry of redemption. Only God can pull that off. This will always be a point of tension within us, this envying after God's centrality. It is, in fact, the sin that goes all the way back to Genesis. It's the sin in the Garden of Eden when man envied the knowledge of God and decided to eat from the tree. It's the envy that pushed Cain to murder his brother Abel for a birthright that could never deliver the self-centering story he wanted to live. Envy is the obsession of King Saul who devoted his life to killing David, the man of God who was chosen to take over rule. He couldn't stand it. His anger and his bitterness grew so high that David had to die. This envy is a personal affair between you and someone else. God is not an abstract notion. Envy is the undercurrent of all of our lives. You know, it feels like it feels like the bitter resentment that you have towards someone who has an advantage over you. Right? The the rich rule over us, don't they? But none of us are rich. We, we all want a little bit more riches and we resent the rich because they got a little bit more. But if only we had it, then we'd be a little better off. They but envy is not just we want their riches, it's we can't stand it that they have it too. You ever driven your car down the highway? You bought a new car, you look across, somebody's got a nicer car than you. Immediately, I have 10 reasons why my car is way better than their Ferrari. My F-250 from 2002 will run over your Ferrari, man. You want diesel in your face? It, envy after God is literally idolatry. We want to be God. And friends, it's a very personal offense to want to be God. It's a very personal offense to a God who is infinitely holy and just. You see, God is not some nebulous cloud of abstract rules that we must follow and regulations that we must adhere to. Jesus did not come personally to take on flesh and to proclaim a God like this. He came to say, no, you are face to face with the living God. There's no abstract nonsense going on here. You're sinning against God himself when you envy for control of your life. It offends him to his face like me spitting in the face of my father as a child saying, I need it my way. Our complaining and bitter envy against God. Cornelius Plantiga, an author, wrote a book called Not the Way It's Supposed to Be. He says in there that envy is a nastier sin than mere covetousness. What an envier wants, first of all, is not what another has. What an envier wants is for another not to have it. We want to be God. We want to be gods unto ourselves. Our envy for the centrality of Christ is the sin that God uses to send Christ to the cross. Guys, this is such a sobering presentation of the gospel. It's truly liberating when you see your envy after God and realize what He's doing, gracefully working His love into your life, His glory into your life. I struggle with this kind of thing all the time. I, I love the blessings of God's people and His presence and I love the blessings of being a part of a church and the promise of eternal life and the riches of glory. But, but Jesus is Lord at center, demanding lordship over all. Woo! <laughs> Everything? Like, uh, what about my finances? What about the way I think my... This and... <laughs> I can't say some things. What, what about the way I think things should go for me? He really is calling himself Lord. 
you see, guys, our lives really do exist to bring him praise. It is the all-satisfying glory of God that will bring you the most satisfaction in life. I hope you're beginning to see that, that you and I envy the centrality of Christ in all things. You know, this is, not, this is not an enjoyable thing to deliver. You guys look very happy right now. Um, I try to convince myself that this text clearly illuminates the worst of people, the murderers of God, but I'm, I'm certainly no way that bad. I've never shouted crucify God before, not with my mouth. I've tried to find a way to, to preach this text without implicating all of us in this envy after God. But it's impossible. We simply want to be in control. The clearest picture of this, the result of this, is certainly death. Jesus gets sentenced to death here. But what is true is that you and I and all of us will die. You know, it's the, death is the coming reality, and it's not the result of the processes of evolution that brings about our death. It's the result of our rebellion against an infinite and holy God. If Adam had not taken the fruit and envied after God's lordship over his life, we would not have to have followed in that same sinful lineage. How death is imminent for us all. The song to crucify Jesus is playing throughout all this world. You don't need to walk two minutes through any store before you, you start to see the magazine covers screaming for self-indulgence, self-centering, the best life now. It's all about you, me, my, and how I can have it better. Even at the worst of economic times, we're still borrowing our way into comfort. The liberating truth is that you and I make a terrible center of the world, but Jesus Christ truly is center. The self-centeredness of man seems to command this story. Jesus seems to be bound, seems to be led away and sentenced to his death, and he truly had to be for you and I to be free. Satan seems to be gaining ground here. His poisonous threats and our cries to crucify Jesus. But God is still in control. He commands the morning and the sun and the stars and the moon, and he weaves every single breath of your life into his redemptive plan. If you don't see it now, you will see it on the day you fall on your knees and worship to him upon his return. It says at the end of the passage, I think 14 or 15, so Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, Release for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. I, I got up at 3 a.m. this morning. I couldn't sleep because the uh, conclusion I drew up wasn't true. I don't think it's true. So I rewrote it. Because what I wanted to do was to please you guys. I wanted to bring this around to a really happy place really quickly. I wanted to make Barabbas out to be a picture of salvation. But I'm not sure that he is. It says that Barabbas was released. A murderer involved in the insurrection. It says he was released. It, it truly is a picture of, of God's justification of sinners. But I don't know that this is a picture of, of Barabbas being saved. Surely we would have heard about him in Acts. Remember that guy Barabbas, the murderer who was set free? But we don't. But the, what we see here is more of a picture of humanity, a picture of our own murderous hearts. What we see is Barabbas, the murderer, he's in prison, he gets released. And walking back to the crowd, you have to picture the moment. Is What's Barabbas thinking? Is he looking down at the crowd that's shouting, crucify, crucify, and he's like, oh yeah, shout that because it lets me out of here. Is that what he's shouting or is he shouting, what just happened to me? I've been set free. Mark leaves us hanging in this moment for a reason. 
the story unfolds in this way so that you and I will walk down those steps in the shoes of Barabbas and ask ourselves, Jesus is getting crucified, I'm getting set free, what will I choose? Will I, will I join in the shouting of this world to crucify the King of Glory? Or will I see the redemptive work that He's just done in my life at no, no doing of my own? I think there, there are moments in all of our lives where God's common grace on us all opens our eyes for a moment to His mercy that He's having on us. Maybe it's the way that you woke up this morning or yesterday and it was, wasn't it the most beautiful of days? God's common grace spreading across all of Atlanta and all the people, regardless of what they believe, His grace shining down. You go to any grocery store in this city and it's filled with produce. To the, to, it's overflowing. That's God's common grace abounding the laughter of my children in my arms, His common grace abounds, the fact that unbelievers aren't crushed at all the times that they reject God with their lives, His common grace abounding. I think this is a picture of Barabbas walking in the common grace of God, and we get to ask ourselves, will I join with the world and shout, Crucify Jesus? Or will I get on my knees and see the centrality of God in all things? This is truly the glorious center of this story. It's not envy. Envy, envy after God, it may ravage our landscape, but the glorious center of this picture is the centrality of God and Christ in all things. I say this, I believe that Jesus clung to this truth in this moment because of um, a commentary in 1 Peter. Peter probably helped Mark write his gospel. And if you want to turn there with me, it's 1 Peter 2. This is, this is sweet. This is where everything changes. And y'all can, we can all take a breath, a break, and we can start to breathe the fresh air of the gospel of God. It says this. It says in verse 20, 20 uh, let's go 20. 1 Peter 2, 20. It says, For what credit it is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called. Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. This is the glorious center of the gospel here, that Jesus Christ, at the moment of his own trial, when he's being condemned and sentenced to death, and the murderers of God go free, what is he clinging to here? He's clinging to the character and the infinite holiness and worth and value of an all-surpassing God. It's not so, it's the, first, the gospel is not firstly that God loves us. That's the fruit of the centrality of God in all things. He does love us immensely so at the, at the price of Jesus' blood. But it's the God, it's that God is infinite, holy, and good, and just, and freeing, and life-giving, and life-breathing. It's God himself that satisfies the soul. Philippians 3, 7, seven and eight or somewhere in there says but whatever gain i had i counted as loss compared to the surpassing worth of knowing christ jesus my lord he is the only surpassing worth that will satisfy us and this is the glorious center of this story it's not our envy after god that wins it's the glorious god who says i'm bigger than that and while you're shouting, crucify me, I'm shouting a grace so good and so free that it really will change your life. 
You'll start walking down the steps of judgment into the world that's shouting crucify God and you'll start saying, I can't help but to believe that I've been set free. <laughs> and I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a God hater. I'm the murderer of God that's been set free. I mean, I'm not trying to like evangelize and mess with your life. I'm just saying it's a pretty good deal. I know you hate God and you want to be the sinner, but he really is and you can, you can have his righteousness now. This is the glorious center of the story. The centrality of God in all things. It's the glorious truth that I've felt in Reformed theology. It's not so much that God is making much of man. It's that he's making much of himself. And one of the fruits of that is the love he has for us. This is absurd, by the way. No one starts a movement like this. No one starts a religion putting God on trial. But God is radically absurd to us, and He's gloriously good. Right in the middle of all of our shouts to crucify God, He sets us, our Barabbas, that's not a word, our murdering Barabbas hearts free. I'm going to fit it in there. In the very moment that we are shouting at God, crucify, 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 the sweet loving grace of our Heavenly Father, a grace so definitive and clear, can you not taste it? It's better than the, anything you'll ever find in this world. While I was going over my, my manuscript yesterday, my uh, two-year-old came in and was jumping on my head and laughing. And I was trying to be real serious about the envy we have after God, and he's just laughing, and so I'm tickling him, and I'm saying, and we envy after God. And I just can't help but to think that right in the moment of my envy is the sweet glory of my child's song. An innocence so clear in his laughter. This is grace. I mean, Barabbas is like a dude getting drugged behind a Mack truck for 100 miles. He is not living a cool life. No one wants to live the, a prisoner's life. And then he gets released. That's you and I, friends. You go, you go from the halls of prison to the halls of joy. What else can satisfy but the glory of God? Grace is so, so sweet. It tastes so much better than envy after God. I don't want to be center when I see how much he's done. All the weight of decay of my human heart gets washed away in the ocean of this grace. I just walked away from a heart that truly was bound to hating God, to saying, I don't need a Savior when there is no sin. I don't need to make up any other religion when God is in control. God just did something in my heart. He set me free. You see the, the most beautiful thing, the story doesn't end here, does it? It keeps going, it goes on. Our envy after the centrality of Christ is the thing that sends Christ to the cross. And without the cross, there is no justification. Without the cross, there is no propitiation. There is no wrath-absorbing death of Jesus so that we don't receive the wrath of God. Without the cross, at the end of this story, you and I are still bound and not free. But the cross is coming in the very moment that we think we're in control. God truly has it all together. God's grace fills his people when they realize, like Barabbas, that they've been released to watch this story of, of redemption continue and unfold. Because of grace, I see myself in Barabbas' shoes, walking down the steps of my, what should have been my sentencing. And I look back and I see the shackles laying up on those steps. And I see Jesus, the Son of God, the center of creation being taken off to the post of scourging, the beginning of the payment for my sins. By His wounds we are healed. He is led away like a 
silent lamb before its shears, like a lamb that is silent, he's being led to his slaughter. And there's no whips being torn across my back. (laughs) They're going to get torn across his. There's no punishment by moral code being imposed upon me by religious leaders. There's only grace for me. There's not even a slap on the wrist. And Barabbas, you see, he's actually truly free. It seems like he doesn't even have to accept this kind of marvelous grace, does he? We don't know what happens. Mark leaves us hanging to ask ourselves what we're going to do. Jesus truly is King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the most satisfying presence in all creation. There's no pleasure as high as this. There's nothing in all creation that's as satisfying as this. When you see your murderous heart get set free and you realize this, Christ really is center, things will start to change. You meditate on this day after day. You start making decisions that don't put you at the center of the story. You start to realize that your story is really not about you, that it's just being woven into God's story, that what God's doing in your life is culminating in His grand glory, not yours, and you're free. You don't need to try to make it your way anymore. You don't need to try to manipulate people with anger to have it your way. You don't believe the McDonald's slogan anymore. It's not your way. It's God's, and that really is better. I'm going to read uh, Colossians 3. It's a, it's a centering, it's a picture of how central Christ is in all things. If the band would go ahead and come up. And as I read this, I would love it that if you feel the very same weight of envy you have after God's control over your, over your life, but yet you want to know that Christ really is centered, that you would just confess these words with me as I read them. Confess that you want Christ to be center, to be Lord of all. After that, we're going to stand and we're going to worship. And I just encourage you in response, just let your heart of envy go here. For a moment, see that Christ is center of the world. It says this in Colossians. It says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything He might be preeminent. For all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. For in Him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through Him to reconcile Himself to all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace by the blood of His cross. Truly, Jesus is center. Truly he is Lord. Would you stand and sing?